Good morning, church. Hallelujah. It's so good to be here. You know, when, when you share the word elsewhere, it's so exciting. And when you share the word in CFAN, in our church, it's all the more exciting. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, what a word we've been receiving these uh, lately from Pastor Raymond, from Pastor Srini. You know, we've been loaded with the scriptures, the word of God. And so we've been learning a lot from that. And uh, the last two weeks, Pastor was talking about the purpose, position, and uh, preparation. You know, we are, we are receiving a lot of it. And uh, today, God has given a word in my heart and for the church. And before that, I want to tell you something. Uh, in 2015, the first time, uh, I was given an opportunity in 9th hour to talk to a group of youngsters in Trivandrum. Right? I was scared to talk. That was the first time for me, you know, to... to meet a crowd. And I was scared not only because of it, talking to them because Pastor Srini was in the crowd. And I was so scared. And I was talking for the first time and he was also there. And now after seven years, this is the first time that you are sitting there, but I'm not scared. Praise God for that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, God has put a word in my heart for us church today. And before that, I want to introduce a couple of people to you. Sam, can I have the first picture on the screen, please? Yeah. This is, oh, okay. This is a tomb which is in Jerusalem, Israel. And this garden of tombs are called the garden of the righteous, the righteous of the nations. And these people all around, you can see, are the Jewish people. And this is the tomb of a man who was a German. And his name was... Oskar Schindler. Why a connection between the Germans and the Israelis is, is a big question. I don't know how many of you know about this man, but he was instrumental in saving the lives of 1,200 Jewish people at the time Hitler was hunting them down. You know, he was an industrialist. He was a spy working for the Nazis, and he was a gambler, and all the worldly side that you can imagine for a person, and he had all that. But how did he end up rescuing these 1,200 Jewish people is the question here. And now there are people in, in Israel, they're called Schindler Jews. And they remember him for that. All their children, their families were separated from them. They were killed in the Holocaust. They were killed in the concentration camp. He was bribing the Nazis. He was using his influence. He was using his wealth to buy, to keep these people in his factory. He actually went to Poland to make money. He hired Jewish people because of cheap labor. But why he ended up saving these people is a question. And... I want to talk about another lady, and her name is, can I have the next picture? Her name is Anuradha Koirala Durum. She's not very famous, you know, this name is not very famous as the celebrity names, but she is from Nepal. She was born in a very well-educated family. She went on to become a social worker. She had a heart to work among the people, and what she did was she started an NGO. And she started working among the trafficked girls. You know, a lot of girls in their teens were trafficked into India and sold for prostitution. She was working among them. She worked with the police. She worked with the border police. And she went into the brothel houses in India and the borders along Nepal. You know how many people were saved by this lady? She's in her 70s now. From 1993 to 2022. 50,000 girls and women were rescued by this lady. She was selected as a hero of CNN in 2010. She is known as the Mother Teresa of Nepal. And what she does is she has a house in, or she has the facilities in Kathmandu where she accommodates these people. And they reunite this rescued girls to their families. If they cannot, if some families, they don't accept them. Though, make sure that they have enough to sustain themselves. Then she releases them. And she is known as the Mother Teresa of Nepal. Why I'm talking about these people? 
you will come to know as I progress into the word of God. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 30. Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 30. So 30th verse says, So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. He was looking for a person who stands in the gap to make a wall and stand in the gap on behalf of the land that he should not destroy it. But the tragic part of this verse is, or what Bible says, I found no one. So when you read this chapter, you need to understand the context of it. So when God, why he is looking for a man, why he is looking for a person to stand in the gap. So we need to understand that. You know, when you read the chapter, chapter 22, we talk about God is so angry with Israel. He is so angry. He is telling Ezekiel, Ezekiel, you know, I am so angry and upset with my people. They are not walking according to my statutes. And in the first, the, the verse 1 to 12 is talking about what as a land, as a people, they did. Bloodshed in the land, oppression in the land, idolatry, robbery, murder. And he says, my people have forgotten me. He says, they have forgotten me. I am angry. I'm upset. I am going to make them a reproach unto the nations. And he is so angry and he is so, it's so painful and he is keep on talking. You know, I'm going to make them a wasteland. I'm going to make them as a waste and all the things God is saying, I'm going to bring this upon this land. And he's very specific when you, when you see from the verse 13 to 29, he's talking very specifically about the people. He's talking about the prophets. He's talking about the priests. He's talking about the princes. And he's talking about the people there. What's up with the prophets there? You know, we know as a prophet of the nation, when you read Israel, they were. Samuel was the first judge. He was the prophet and he was the judge. That's the position they hold in that nation. And he's saying, the prophets are speaking lies. They say that I have heard from the Lord, but they are speaking lies. And they are making ungodly gain from them. They devour the man. They devour the widows. And they take, they took hand into the treasures and he's taking it up. The prophets. Then comes the priest. The very people who are there to make the atonement or intercession on behalf of the people. Bible says, God is saying to Ezekiel, you know what they do? They are making the holy things into unholy. They are not making my people walking in the ways of the Lord. And they are defiling the land by doing all this. And I was talking about the princes there. Princes are the one or the kings are the one who need to bring the, the right judgment to bring peace into the land. And is saying, these princes of my people are shedding blood. They are oppressing my people. And what they are doing is they are gaining out of it. So my people cannot look unto the prophet, the priest, the prince. What I am seeing, they are all walking away from the Lord. They have forgotten me. And finally, he's also talking about the people. They are robbing each other. They are oppressing each other. They are not treating the strangers in your midst well. They are not honoring the parents. He is angry. He is upset. He wants to bring all this upon his people. And this time, he is telling. But, he's saying, so I sought a man. I looked for a man. 
who would build a wall and intercede for the land that I will not destroy it. But I have found none. He's not looking for a prophet. He's not looking for a priest. He's not looking for anybody for that matter. He's looking a one person from the crowd, from the people that you would make a wall. And I have found none. This is the significance of those two people I was talking about. You look around and this is a situation that we see in the world now. The so-called everybody is not doing what they are supposed to do. And in this time, the people who are there not even having God in their life, as we know, but they stepped into it. They took action. They risked their lives to save someone else. I'm not saying we need to get encouraged about all these people. Praise God for that. Books were written on them. Movies are made out of it. But you and I are just looking at it and saying, wow, such a heroic act. But where are you fitting in? Where am I fitting in this? That's the question that is asking. God is on the lookout for a person that he will stand in the gap for my people. If they can do, we say, the God, we know our Lord. We know our Lord. And we have God in us. But the so-called people, if they could do, how much more you and I can do? You know, when I thought about, when I was reading about those 50,000 girls, and I was thinking about those 50,000 families, 1,200 people, 1,200 families, and their children, their children are thanking God, knowingly or unknowingly, for these people. How much more you and I can do? How much more you and I should do? So now, coming back to this, I sought for a man. Now we need to really look at what are those qualities God is looking in? He said, that man or that person should be building a wall, interceding for the land. So what is that? What is he talking about? It is not talking about, it is not mentioned anywhere about building a wall there. It is not a physical wall he's talking about. It is not about a wall is coming, so make a wall that it will protect you from the enemies. No, it is not talking about that. It is talking about something else. It is not physical. It is talking about the spiritual wall. So he is looking for a man who is ready to build a spiritual wall, a spiritual prayer wall around those people so that the consequences of their sin will not hit them. The wall signifies safety. The wall signifies protection. The people in the olden time, even now, they, when we have a compound wall, we think that we are safe. We have a gate, we put a lock, we think that we are safe. Even now we have that, we put that wall around us. But here God is telling, I'm not talking about a physical wall here. I'm talking about a spiritual wall. The significance of it, I want a man or a woman to build a spiritual wall for my people. So there is hope and it also shows something. The God who is really angry with us or angry with the people, but again, that shows his love. He doesn't want to destroy his people. He doesn't want anything harm to happen to them. That's the love of our God. I am still looking. You know, God's things work according to the principles of God. People ask, then why can't he just say that, hey, it's okay, I'm not going to do it. No, it doesn't happen that way. That's why he has to send his only son to save our lives. That's the principle of the kingdom. He is looking for a man. So now the question is, how are we building our walls? Hallelujah. Let's look at uh, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4. Nehemiah 1.4 So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Nehemiah. When we hear about that word, what we always comes in our mind is rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Right? 
So it's always connects with the rebuilding the wall. We always go and connect our memory. We read the word, hey, the wall around Jerusalem, the wall around Jerusalem. He rebuilt it. And now when we look what he was actually doing or why did he do what he did is the importance. That's where we need to put our attention and learn from. You know, everything what we speak or everything we hear, it is for a purpose. It is not for us to understand, but it is us to understand and act on it. Hallelujah. When God is asking a question, uh, who is there? But here in Nehemiah, we see a man who is ready to build a wall. And that also, it is not a physical wall. Yeah, the result was a wall, a rebuilding a wall around Jerusalem. But when we really closely look at his life, we know the wall was actually built in his prayer closet. Who was Nehemiah? You know, he said, Nehemiah 1.4. Uh, Sam, can I have that again? Okay. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept. And mourn for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So now here is certain things, some words I want to highlight. He says, I wept. I mourned for days. I prayed. I fasted. I wept. I mourned. I prayed. I fasted. For what? So when you see the background, this man was a cupbearer in a Persian king's palace. You know, the, when, when we see a cupbearer, the person who is pouring wine or the drinks into the royal table, we think it has a very nominal job. I was actually thinking, but they were high-ranking officials in the palace. And the king would confidently trust upon what he pours. So he always, so those people have a very confidential relationship with the king. And everyone in the kingdom or in the palace he is in a very influential position. And he was well settled there. He was not a priest. He was not a prophet. He was not a chosen one at that time. And he was not a prince. He was like you and I working in a land. But why did he weep? Why did he mourn? And that's the thing we really need to understand. So here, he, he heard something from his, one of the brethren. Bible says here, one of the brethren, they visited Judah. They came back to this nation. And he is asking him, how is the situation of our people back in Judah? And he's telling, their situation is very bad. They are in a very, very difficult time. And they are going through, they are having a tough time. They are in distress. They are in distress. And at that time, they mentioned something else which he did not ask. And he says, the walls of Jerusalem are also broken down. And the gates are burned. So when Nehemiah asked about the people, he added one more information and say, hey, the walls of Jerusalem are broken down and the gates. What is the relationship between the situation of the people in Judah and the broken wall? And when he heard that, the fourth verse says, he was mourning. He wept. He prayed. He fasted. You know, Bible says, historian says he, he must have fasted for, he might have fasted for three months, right? The, the month of Chislev to the month of Nisan, they say it's a three months time, whatever it is. So pastor is saying it's five months, it's five months. So uh, when God speaks to him, when he heard from Hanani, the brethren, at that time, he got a burden. And I was thinking, the very man who went and saw the situation in Judah did not have the burden like Nehemiah who heard from the person who saw it. What made him so burdened about the people over there? And I'm saying, I want to remind you, he was not a prophet. He was not a priest. He was not a chosen one. He was a guy who was working like you and I in a foreign land. But what made him to ask, first of all, and to pray and go on a time of fast and prayer like no one else did. That's what we need to look. God asking for a person who would make a wall. Who would make a wall. You know, you need to, you need to make the spiritual walls first and the physical will follow. And when Bible says, as he was having the time in the presence of God, as he was going through the prayer, and we read the prayer, he was, 
he was quoting scriptures. He was saying, God, you said to our fathers that when we repent and come back, you will deliver the land. And on behalf of myself, my father's family, on behalf of the land, I am coming to you, Lord. And I am praying. You know, this was going on for months. This was going on for months. He was working, but his prayer was happening. He was building that wall. He was building the spiritual protection. He was building that spiritual protection of the people of Jesus. Judah in that faraway land so that God will take him one day to make or to build the physical wall. So you and I, he's asking a question. I am looking for a man, but I have found none. But yet today he's also looking for a man and a woman. And the question today is, will you be found by God when he's looking for you? And how was that life? Are you and I the one who just hear and forget about it? Are you going to be there simply hearing, hey, I heard about that land. I heard about that person's life. It's so sad, then leave it. Oh, no, 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 Nehemiah was not like that. So exactly what God was asking in Ezekiel 22, we see a man exactly like that here. So now... Our God, the Holy Spirit, is not different. The ordinary man who was working in a palace could do that. You and I can do that today. And we are more privileged in the new covenant. We have the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says, you are the temple and God dwells in you. So if you and I have that Holy Spirit in us, how much more you and I need to do? Hallelujah. This is what end. He is not talking about his own thing. You know, we need to, you know, our prayer request, nothing wrong in asking uh, for yourself and your family. No, God is, is a loving God. He's a heavenly father. You can. But when you are in the presence of God, and I was thinking, Lord, why did he get this burden which other eyewitnesses could not get? I believe, I believe, this is my belief, that this is not the time that he went on a time of prayer and fasting. I think he, this was his habit. This was his habit, the prayer in the presence of God. Praying about the people in Judah. Praying about the people in captivity. And he was praying and expecting God would send a person. God would send a prophet. God would send a deliverer to the city. So that one day we will all go back. One day we will all live in that city. Surrounded with that wall. Worshipping the living God. And he was praying for years. For years. For years. And with that burden. When you spend that time in the presence of God. What happens is the burden, the heart of God gets revealed. The heart of God gets imparted into your heart. But when you see people, when you hear about things, you know, you pray like this. Otherwise, your prayer will be just a prayer. You pray in a group, you pray, you see a message in the WhatsApp and you just leave it like that. I'm not talking all of us are like that. I was there, but I'm saying I don't want to stay there. I want to progress. I want to be in the presence of God so that when I hear something, I decide. I wept. I mourned. I fasted. I prayed not for my family, not alone, but I am praying for somebody who is far away. Somebody who is living not with that security. I am praying for them. You know, this is what happens when you love the Lord. When you love the Lord, what happens is you have the love of God towards people. Otherwise, you will not have it. Period, you will not have it. I know a person, his name is Abai. He's a pastor from Lucknow. We came to know in one of the ninth of our meetings there. And he's from a community. Pastor knows there is a community there. Usually what they do is they beg on the street or they steal things. They're known for that. But he got saved from that, and now he is doing an amazing work in UP, in, in Sultanpur. And, and we know him, he's connected to Pastor Shaji also. You know, I, I love something about this guy. You know, many a times he attended the Zoom meeting, we can see his church, we can see his house, the broken walls, the shed, but he's so happy. You know, a couple of times he requested something to us. You know, one time he never requested anything for himself. He never requested that I don't have, please send it to me. He never. One time he asked, winter is coming. 
And in my community, there are 25, 50, or 25 or 50 kids from the age of 4 to 13. Can you please ask somebody to help them with jackets? Praise God, that was done. Another time, he, the request was this. I know a community, a village, around 90 families are there. And those families don't have drinking water. You know, what they do is they go one kilometer away to a place and they use the borewell. But since these most of them are Christians, the other village don't allow them. The water available in that village is not drinkable and that will affect. But they ended up using that because there's long walk and there's operation from there. But the request was, if you give this much, a very nominal amount, what would happen is we can do a borewell and a hand pump. And in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a few days, it happened. And he did not ask this for pastor's family. Or he did not ask for himself. He asked for another community. You know, that shows me when you sit in the presence of God. When you have the heart of God. Your request will not be yours. Your request will be for someone else. You know, we can sit back and say nothing wrong in it, but God expects more from you and I. That's why the tragedy was, I found nobody. But now he found one in Nehemiah. And you and I, the question today to you and I is, are you crying? Are you praying in your prayer closet? It's only for yourself or are you looking ahead? Are you looking beyond your personal spaces or you're building your walls around people? In your life. You need to look around. You need to look around. Uh, can we have uh, Matthew's 9. Matthew 9, 34, Sam. This is a wonderful verse. You know, we were talking from the Old Testament, the Nehemiah, the Ezekiel. But here, Jesus' words. Verse 36. Verse 36, please. But when he, when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Next verse. Then saith he unto his disciples. Can I have it in KJV? Yeah. It's KJV. Yeah. Uh, okay. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So, therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus is looking, you know, he is looking beyond the natural. He is looking and what he is seeing is not people. He is, he is seeing the situation, the tragedy, the difficulties that they face. They are like sheep without shepherd. So now the solution for that is he is talking to his disciples so that you pray. The Lord of the harvest to send more laborers. Ezekiel 22.30 says, not only to make a wall but to stand in the gap for my land. And here Jesus is also saying, he is looking at it and he's talking to the disciples. Guys, you guys are not enough. You are not enough. We need more because the harvest is plentiful. You know, the situation of Ezekiel 22 is there. The Pharisees, the, the Sadducees, all people were there. But it was exactly the same situation. The prophets failed, the priests failed, the people failed, the princes failed. Here also the same thing. Looking at them, Jesus is saying, see what I see is not the people. I see the state of their mind. But you need to pray. The answer is only this, more laborers into the harvest. Are you and I ready to move into those harvests is the question that we need to ask. You know, everything happens or everything begins in your prayer closet. How serious are you about your personal prayer time? That's when you, you, you don't look only upon yourself. You understand the heart of God. Yes, you have the prayer request. Yes, you have everything. But what you look beyond, you start looking beyond that and you start building the spiritual walls around your colleagues. The spiritual walls around your friends. The spiritual walls around your relatives. 
the spiritual walls around the people of this land of other faith. That's why you and I are here for. Nehemiah was there for a reason. Because he was there in the palace, he could get that influential position and he could go back with the protection and all the requirements to rebuild. And he did it in 52 days. But actually the spiritual construction was done in the prayer closet. Hallelujah. And what you and I are doing today, Jesus' prayer, pray for more laborers. When you look at yourself, you know, important thing is he's looking not for a priest or a prophet or anybody. He's looking for a man and a woman. If those people who did such heroics for the fellow human being risking their lives and their generations are going to thank and still thanking, then how much more you and I can do to change the eternity of many lives in our generation. That's what we need to look at. That's what we need to focus on. Go beyond, go beyond. Like Jesus said, I'm going to pray today. I, I read a wonderful biography of a person called Lauren Cunningham. Lauren Cunningham is the founder of YWAM. YWAM is Youth with a Mission. He was an American. He was born in 1935. At the age of 24, he was a pastor. He was working with a, a, a church over there, but he had a heart for young people. Then what he did was he, he take them out for camps. So one day he took a group of people to Bahamas. And there he was praying, and he was praying in his hotel room. He had an amazing vision. He had a map of the world on the wall, and he was praying. Then he started seeing the shorelines are actually taking over the ground. And the shorelines, all the water became young people. And this young people is taking over, is going to other nations and talking about their faith. That's where YVAM began. In 1960s began. He is now he now lives and 62 years it's still active. You know, we go many a times, we work with them. The passion they carry is something different that is coming from this person. And I'm telling you, the 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 great part is this: God gave him this great vision. He came back to US and he talked about this vision, and people ridiculed him. He said, this is such a big thing. And what you can do is you, you continue with what you are doing. And he has an aunt who was married to a rich person at that time. And he was very close to that aunt. And one day she called and they did not have a son. She called him and said, uh, Lauren, I have a plan. Uh, what we are planning to do is you are going to be the heir of our industries or of our business. He heard it. So he said, as a young man, I can still continue my work for God and I can take over this business. But he slept over it. And the next day he walked up to her and said, no, I don't want to do this because I want to obey the call of God in my life. I'm not going to be staying back. The testimony is this. Pray for more laborers. When you are in the prayer closet, you are an answer to someone's prayer. You are an answer to someone's prayer. So Lauren, somebody was praying for send a person to start something and he started in oh, 60 years back and still is it active. And you and I are sitting here. You and I are the man God is looking for with a lot of capacity inside of you. A lot of that seed inside of you. And in your prayer, what is birth out can change the nations. When we sit there and think and read the biographies of the Livingstones and the Bonkes and William Careys, you need to think that I am going to be, or I have the capacity to do that for the kingdom. You are that person and I believe that I can do that. I not only read such biographies and I read the word of God, I gain that revelation from it and I say Lord in my prayer close it the people in Judah the people in other nations or the people in my church people who's next to your person who's next sitting next to me I'm going to pray and I'm going to build a, a spiritual wall of protection around that person that's where revival begins. That's where changes happen. That's where you and I become an instrument in the hand of God. Nothing more, nothing less. He is looking for that harvest. Are you ready?
Or it is going to be a tragic situation like he said, I have found none. I have found nobody who would stand in the gap. But today the question to us is, are you ready to move for God? You really need to think about your life. We heard from the word. Now, every time we read, we have a personal time of reading the Bible. And we have, we make, we have our journals and we have a habit of sending out the forewords and everything. But pause for a moment and think, what am I really doing for the kingdom? This is a question today. You can do a lot of things. I came to the Lord because somebody invited me to a church 22 years back. And I have done the same. I've invited many. And I, I still do that. But I always desired for more people to join the kingdom of God from that age. And today, I praise God. And when I see others also doing the same, zealous about God, talking about Jesus to others, bringing people, going out of the way, picking people and dropping them back, I see, oh my God, yes, praying for more harvest, harvesters, praying for more laborers. They should be our prayer. They should be our prayer. Not today, forever. Then in that prayer closed, our selfish prayers will fade out. Our selfish desire for the ministry will fade out. We will stand and say, Lord, I am concerned about that perishing soul. I am concerned about that nation. I am concerned about my neighbor. You know, preparing and praying made, convicted my life. My prayer life changed. We tend to forget things. But it's good that daily reading the Bible will remind you. We get back to it. So like Nehemiah, have a habit of that prayer life so that when you hear, you always go on the knees and weep for it. And when God speaks something into your life, dare to do it. Take that action. In your action is hundreds, maybe thousands or hundreds of thousands of souls. Think about Bonke. Think about all these people. But don't stop there. Look at yourself through the eyes of God. Because He is looking for you. He wants you. Hallelujah. I want you to rise upon your feet. Thank you, Jesus. This moment is between you and God. This is between you and God. This is between you and the perishing world. You are standing when you see a person in your office, in your college. You see a person in your family or you talk to a person. You remember if he is not having Jesus in his life, he is heading eternal fire. What is your thinking at that time? Or are you still there praying for those prayers I have written down for my life? I have written down these are the plans. Nothing wrong in that. But this is a time to add to your list to send more harvesters. Someone's prayer triggered a person or people to move from one nation to another, one continent to another continent. And sometimes one flat to other flat. Or one chair to the next chair. This is a time. This is a time He's speaking to you. The question today is, will you be found by God when He's looking for you? Or you will disappoint Him? Or will you disappoint Him? Take a decision today. He is a loving father. He loves you so much. He has not only loved you, he has given his Holy Spirit to dwell in your life. That's why the Bible says when you receive him, you receive the power to become the witness. 
the primary sign of you having the holy spirit is you witness jesus to someone hallelujah this is a time he is speaking into your life this is the solemn moment that you are conversing with god that now on in your prayer closet you build walls around people you build walls around cities you build those spiritual walls around nations and every hindrance will be broken down as we sang a song today that bobby was leading when shouted israelites were shouting the walls of jericho which was a hindrance broken down but when we raise up prayers when this protection the wall of protection will be built around people Thank you Lord. Thank you Lord. Thank you for speaking to us. We as a church we want to move into where you want us to go. We want to see like Jesus so. We want to pray as he requested. He asked us to pray. Thank you Lord. Thank you. In Jesus name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Have a great week. Continue to read the word and pray. And when he asks, when he looks for a man, you should be there. Amen.